guy that has a senior year like Doug McDermott did it great in a couple of years ago. And not only does Valpo have Alec Peters to fill it up, but they've got Bashil Fernandez protecting the rim. He is number one in America, 3.3 blocks per game. And an outstanding student who is working on his second master's degree. And Kyle Collinsworth is complimented by Chase Fisher, first team, all WCC, averaging over 18 a game. And 22, Bob, in the NIT as well. Bryce Drew brings a Valpo team in. That has Alec Peters over his last eight games averaging well over a double-double. And it has been balanced for BYU. I guess if you're going to score 84 points per game and be number six in America in scoring, you have to get it from more than just two players. And they have had, in this tournament, five players averaging double figures. When you watch BYU tonight, oh, that's good hands right there, right off the bat. Valpo can guard as well. They are number nine in America in opponents' points against. So a contrast in styles as the Crusaders. It'll be their defense probably against the up-tempo BYU Cougs. Oh, I would agree with that. A turnover on the first possession of the game for Valpo after they got a takeaway. And how special is it for these teams, disappointed a couple of weeks ago, to not be included in the NCAA tournament, refocusing, and now having a chance to play here at the Garden. We saw some of the players walking in in this place in awe earlier today at Shooter. Every one of the four coaches said their team showed up at that next Monday practice, bound and determined to win as many games as they could. A double team in the corner, and unloading was Collinsworth. Nick Emery, he's only a freshman, a little too strong, and the rebound pulled down by Keith Carter. Carter, end to end, gives it up, guard to guard, and the finish by Darian Walker. Keith Carter, an outstanding point guard, good quickness. Young man out of Proviso East in Chicago, a, a really, really good high school program. Another takeaway, this time it's Shane Hammock jumping in. He gives it up and throwing it down in transition is Alec Peters. Great start for Valpo and a quick timeout called by Dave Rose. And BYU wants to talk things over. Well, the thing that's impressive is... Seven years, three-time Mountain West Coach of the Year, now in the WCC. And speaking of being a Coach of the Year, Bryce Drew has been just that. Three of his five years in the horizon as the lead guy on the Valpo bench. He's followed... And his dad Homer's footsteps, and he has been a coach of the year this year included. And a pretty good basketball player at Valparaiso in his day. Wasn't bad. Yep. First round pick. And oh, look another at this. deflected pass. Darian Walker with the steal. Oh. Can't finish. Corbin Kafusi pulls down the rebound. And it has been nothing but turnovers for the Cougs so Absolutely. far. Absolutely. And these these guys are usually very proficient in their half-court offense. Collinsworth, back door, extra pass to the corner. Fisher allows the flyby and knocks down the three to get BYU on the board. Well, that was a terrific shot make by Chase Fisher. And what he did, Bob, instead of stepping into the two-point line, he slid along the three so we get that extra point. Well done. Carter turns it over. That's an offensive foul as he caught Nick Emery. Looks like he got him up in the in the mouth area. Keith Carter, the <laughs> no monitor. NIT semifinals. They call the foul. Well, if there was ever an officiating crew that could call it and trust their call, it's Pat Driscoll, John Gaffney, and Brian O'Connell. These are guys that show up in the final four and elite eights here at the Garden as our crew tonight. I want you to watch throughout the night how deep Collinsworth gets into the lane before he makes plays. Shot clock down to seven. Fisher has it taken away. Another steal for Keith Carter. I knew the defense would be good by Valpo, but they have been suffocating. Hamming fouled on the drive. That's a foul on Chase Fisher. That brings Zach Selius in the game for the first time as he will replace Kalfusi. Bob, I watched it over four times in less than three minutes to start. And and that 11 and a half is, is, is even better when you think about how fast a pace they play and how many possessions they play at during the course of the game. Excellent scouting report, excellent defense so far. Little zone now by the Cougars. Hamming 
with the right hand. Fernandez keeps it alive. Darian Walker. He's pinned underneath. So it will stay with Valpo. And coming up after this game, we'll have second NIT semifinal action. San Diego State takes on GW for the right to play in the championship game Thursday at 7 on ESPN. Also streaming live on Watch ESPN and the ESPN app. Walker from the corner. Rattles it home. Darian Walker. Gives it up on the four-point lead. Yeah, you love this kid from the Inglewood section on the south side of Chicago. One of the few people in his family to get a chance to finish his college degree. And he is a tough, hard-nosed player. Kyle Collinsworth will put this one up. Comes up short. Peters gives it up to Hammock. Hammock left alone. Offensive rebound by Peters. Blocked from behind and taken away by Kyle Davis for BYU. So he's is a guy that can really shoot it. This time he gives it up to Kyle Davis. And Davis will go to the free throw line. Now uh, the other end of the court. Watch how good this defense is by BYU. They smother Alec Peters the block. That would have been a second block by Kyle Davis. Good job of protecting the rim. Now Bryce Drew's going to have to go to the bench. That was the second foul on Darian Walker. Walker averages about eight points per game. He has five of Valpo's seven, but now he has to sit down and Vashil Fernandez, the Horizon League Defensive Player of the Year for the second year in a row, also sits down. Kyle Davis has been in double figures in two of the three NIT wins for BYU, helping them get here to Madison Square Garden. Oh, I like this. Because BYU switches, Peterson, Peters goes right into the post versus Emery. Now he pops back out. David Scarra double teamed in the corner. Finds a cutter. That's Tavon Walker, and his floater's good. That was a really good possession by we, BYU. They hand, excuse me, by Valpo. They handled the trap. They got the ball out of it. Found the walker on the, on the second side. Collinsworth is fouled. A reach in by Carter. That's his second as well. Well, both of these teams are powered by seniors, and that has been the theme so far in postseason college basketball. We'll take seniors in many cases electing to come back and eschew the NBA for a while and it's I think it's really been great for the game this this year not very many one and done guys have had any impact on either tournament and Syracuse has two fifth year seniors as arguably their two best players in Trevor Cooney and Michael Benege and Obviously, with Marcus Page coming on, his shooting for North Carolina, oh. probably the biggest reason why UNC has looked like a different team. Bryce Johnson, he's uh, been a double-double machine all season long. It seems yeah. to be Marcus Page being able to knock down threes that has taken the heels to a different place. And there's a guy that's been doing this for a long time. Oh, nice. And Hammock called for the foul. He thought he had a clean block on Kyle Collinsworth. Watch Collinsworth just picks the pocket from behind of Scarra. Chases it down. That, that was Hammock. I'm sorry. Shane Hammock, the transfer from LSU. His dad was an outstanding player at LSU. First round pick. And speaking of LSU, the most celebrated and talked about one and done all season long doesn't even decide as a program after what has to be described yeah. as a disastrous season to play postseason basketball. It's Ben Simmons going to the NBA and LSU is nowhere to be found in any postseason tournament. Two months ago, it would have been a lock. It was over. Ben Simmons, number one pick, and Brandon Ingram, because of what he did in the NCAA tournament and all season, really helped himself. Another heads up play by Kyle, by, uh, Kyle Davis. Peters had it stripped away at one end. Davis trying to finish at the other, but he turns it over. I know we got a lot of international guys in this doubleheader today, but that Euro step. <laughs> was one too many. <laughs> he went east, west, and north, south on that move. Crossed a couple of time zones. 
as each team with five turnovers. There's a bucket inside for Tavon Walker. BYU with five points through the first nearly six minutes as Collinsworth too strong off the window uncontested rebound for Tavon Walker this is a Cougar offense that averages 84 per game number one in the WCC number six in America Nick Emery pushes it up they don't wait for long deep into the shot clock to let shots go but Valpo is a tough defensive group good trap right there at three wide open missed by Chase Fisher Love the way BYU threw that ball out of the trap. Had an answer to get to the weak side, get the open shot, just didn't knock it down. Foul underneath. Called on Celius. Lots of recognition right there. Good look inside. Good basket. Take a look now. Watch Scar, the Croatian. Good find inside. That's a young man that played for the Croatian national team with a guy named Mario Hazonia. Now a rookie with the uh, Orlando Magic. Another foul called on BYU, so that will put Alec Peters at the line. David Skara playing for Croatia's under-17 national team a few years ago. When you would have players mm -hmm. that would get international experience, not just you know bringing their type of basketball to the u.s but playing on national teams even at the junior level what impact did you find that had on players when they played in the u.s in college basketball most of the kids that come from international basketball around the world you think of the kids that go to gonzaga and valpo and other places like that they're much more team oriented than what you would expect out of the american guys now that's changed in recent years but uh, that should be a charge. And it is. Chase but Fisher called for the foul. There was a stretch. There was a stretch of time where I thought I think international players, both in college and the NBA, have helped. Look at the amount of players that Homer Drew, Scott Drew, and now Bryce Drew have convinced to come to Northern Indiana to play 18 different countries. But there's a team-oriented play that I think has been really, really good for both college basketball and the NBA. And just look at the Spurs and the way they talk about that international flow and offense and how much it's helped them. Jordan Chapman called for a reach in. Each team has five fouls here in the first six and a half minutes. This will put Amick at the line, but we are well on our way to both teams being in the penalty. We could shoot a lot of free throws in the first half between these two squads, and they are both excellent free throw shooting teams. One of the reasons I'd love to see the men's college basketball game go to four quarters is because let's say you have five team fouls, Bob. You get to the end of the first quarter, you reset the team fouls so that you don't have guys, as you just pointed out, marching to the foul line over the next 13 minutes. Another turnover. That is seven first-half turnovers for BYU as that one ended up with Adekoya. Hammock can't finish. Here comes Chapman the other way. Collinsworth sets Chapman up for three. He knocks it down. Well, this young man is uh, part of a legacy. Father Jeff played for the Cougs back in the 80s. A lot of family ties here. Nick Emery's older brother, Jackson. Chris Collinsworth played with Jimmy for dead as well. Peters blocked by a couple of different BYU players underneath, but then Chapman double dribbled in the backcourt. One thing that's impressed me early in this game is Valparaiso's defense. Now, it's one of the best defensive teams in the country, but watch them chase Collinsworth, get a hand on it, get in the passing lane, and they've rendered him a little ineffective so far, Bob, but remember, Kyle Coll Collinsworth had the flu last week. He was in bed for about 72 hours. Now, they feel like he got a lot of his strength back, but this is the first time we're really seeing him back full, uh, at almost full strength. Although even when healthy, you saw the numbers. Valpo's a good defensive team. Yes, they are. They're number three in America in opponent's field goal percentage, number nine in opponent's scoring. This time they turn it over there as Calfusi played it perfectly and got the steal Collinsworth jumper comes up short the back tap ends up with a fresh 30 for the Cougars Collinsworth forced one Kalfusi 
runs it down, but it looks like he will be called for the foul as he knocked Nickerson to the deck. And another BYU turnover. And the defense has been absolutely outstanding. With more on that, here's Kaylee. Well, you mentioned that bout with the flu for Kyle Collinsworth. Guys, he didn't show up to their quarterfinal game on Tuesday until about an hour before it started, but he managed to play 20 minutes in that game and get 10 points for his team. The team didn't see him again until Friday. He lost 12 pounds over the course of that week. He couldn't eat at all. He finally made it through a full practice on Monday. A long five days, as Collinsworth described it. 12 pounds. I could use losing 12 pounds. Yeah, but, I mean, here's Kyle <laughs> Collinsworth on the steel. Where is 12 pounds coming off of Kyle Collinsworth? Him and his 24-inch waist? Atakoya gets the rebound. I could lose 12 pounds I'd by just skipping to. two meals. I'm not sure <laughs> how Kyle Collinsworth can afford to lose 12 pounds. Atakoya out of the double team. It's Nickerson now. Tries to play catch with Atakoya. He nice. gives it up. Ooh. Excellent big man to big man pass. And Vashil Fernandez gets to hang from the rim. Oh, what I love about Atakoya is he can play inside and out. And that time showed you handling the ball. Collinsworth, though, with a chance for a three point play at the other end. When we come back, as Valpo has their lead, in danger of being cut to four. Good offense being run by both teams at both ends own right and this really is the first family of Valpo basketball as Homer Drew followed up one year by Scott who's now of course at Baylor and Bryce a three-time conference coach of the year in his five years at Valparaiso and don't forget Dana Drew their sister who is an outstanding player two-time Mac player of the year at Toledo and she married a guy named Casey Shaw wound up playing in the NBA and overseas so it's truly a great basketball family Like they're matching up out of that zone. See a lot of switching. Darian Walker feeds the post with five to shoot. Back outside to Keith Carter. Carter with two on the shot clock. Weaves his way for an open three and connects. A nice crossover dribble. Yes. Created the space he needed. He sure did. Great left to right crossover. Quick trigger three in that one. Is too strong. The rebound ends up with Nickerson off the heart sock miss. Carter this time drives it. Looks back for Fernandez. And he is fouled. Eight point lead for Valpo. And how about Scott's advice for Bryce? Kaylee's got more. Well, Bob, you know, it was just in 2013 when Scott Drew and his Baylor Bears won the NIT. So Bryce called his older brother Scott, disappointed after the selection show that Sunday. And Scott said, hey, embrace this. Get to New York City, and they will treat you right at the NIT. I know. I've been there. <laughs> well, you know. I don't care how far you go in the NIT, your goal every year is to get to the field of 68, but once you don't get selected, that first game is always the tough game to get over the hump. And then you win that game, you win another game, you get to the quarterfinals. Bob, and, and in all four places, GW, BYU, Valpo, and George Washington, great crowds, lifted these teams because you get an opportunity to play in the world's greatest arena, trip to New York. All these teams have embraced it, and I think it's important, the mindset. There's a foul on Nickerson, so that'll be a one-and-one one as we are midway through the first half, and we'll shoot free throws the rest of the way here in the first half, something that Fran Fraschilla would like to see changed. Yeah, four quarters. You know, men's basketball, the only entity right now in the, in the basketball world that doesn't play with four quarters. You get a natural break between the first and the second quarter. And when you start that second quarter, team fouls back to zero. In FIBA basketball, fifth foul, automatically two free throws. No one-on-ones. Can I play devil's advocate? Absolutely. Would you miss the one and one no. I just did the women's tournament this past weekend. Yeah. They've gone to four quarters, and obviously it's five fouls. Yep. And it takes the one and one out of play. And I think sometimes, especially at the ends of closely fought second halves, yep. one and ones add a lot of drama and a lot of tension to the ends sometimes of situational basketball, the way that the teams play but guess what? and the coaches coach. I think it's fun. At the end of the second half, I guarantee you both teams are in the double bonus. 
You know what I mean? So it's two free throws anyway in that regard. The back tap tracked down by Keith Carter. Nice look. Leaning in. Unable to finish but drawing the foul is Walker. So Darian Walker will go to the line to shoot a couple. Try to extend to a double-digit Valpo lead as Kofusi is called for his second foul. And again, as soon as we are done with game number one here at the Garden, on to game number two as the winner of Valpo BYU advances to a Thursday night championship matchup against either San Diego State or George Washington. George Washington defeated Florida at home in a game that was theoretically a Florida home game, but they couldn't play at the O'Connell Center. What would have been interesting if Florida had won? You know who was on the court for Ole Miss when Bryce Drew hit the shot? Florida coach Michael White. Would have been an interesting reunion. Balbo's largest lead. Hits 10. Tell you what, really impressed with Balbo both offensively and defensively, but particularly the D. Whistle away from the ball. It looks like a foul is called underneath. And that is going to go on Tavon Walker of Valpo. So that'll be free throws for BYU. That's Walker's first. Now this young man, Nick Emery, have, has had a terrific freshman year, Bob. Second most points in the history of the school behind Danny Ainge. And he spent two years out of Lone Peak High School on his LDS mission. Came back last summer, and he's got three more, I think, outstanding years. And you know who came home today? Tyler Hawes' little brother, TJ, who was a high school teammate of Nick Emery. He finished his mission, got home today. He'll be on next year's team. Eric Mika, an outstanding player as a freshman at BYU. He'll be home for him before next season. When you put together the BYU roster, you have to know who's coming and going on these LDS missions to kind of keep the balance of your roster intact. How hard is that to do? They have a board in their office that keeps track of every every one of their players through 19, 2019, 2020. Who's leaving, who's coming back, and how they fit into the current roster. That floater won't go for Tavon Walker. And the rebound eventually ends up with Nate Austin. Celius pulls up. Rattles home a three. Now this young man is playing well, but he's going to leave and start his mission next year. You know where he's, you know where his mission's going to be? Des Moines, Iowa. And I'm going to call George Niang and see if they can't get him some pickup games on that one preparation day they have to play a little hoops. A three answered by Darian Walker. So now the offense picks up at both ends. 12 minutes into this first semifinal in the NIT. Celius tries another. That one comes up short. Foul called on Celius. Nope. Check that. Celius had a lane to the basket. Ch chasing after his own miss. And Darian Walker is called for the foul. That's his third. Yeah, this young man, Celius, 50% on the year. He'll leave, as I said, for two years. He'll come back. And you know the... It's, it's tough to have that lack of continuity, but when you get some of these guys back, they're, they're 23, 24 years old, more mature, they love the game, they play it tough, hard-nosed usually. So this kid's finishing up an outstanding freshman year, but Coug fans won't see him for a couple of seasons. And Zach Selyus was the beneficiary of Kyle Collinsworth having the flu and not able to play the normal minutes against Creighton. Boy, did he respond. He was five for six from three and scored 19 in the win over Creighton. Jumping the passing lane, Nick Emery gets the steal. He won't wait. He I'm telling gets you. a three. And just like that, BYU is within five. That's what he does in this 1-3-1 zone with the 6-7 Celius at the top has been a nuisance to the Crusaders. Timeout called by Bryce Drew and Valpo. BYU is <laughs> Everybody taking it in. No doubt about it, Bob. I coached here for a couple of years and grew up watching the Knicks, some of the great teams. It's just an incredible place. By the way, they didn't play in the New Garden, but BYU won the NIT back in 66, 50 years ago in the Old Garden.
Mascara. It's a three. Well, the funny part, as Kaylee mentioned, was guys walking into the building and saying, ah, oh, this is where Mello plays. Exactly, <laughs> of yeah. we're looking up at the Nick banners, and there is only one player whose jersey right now hangs for the Raptors for the Knicks that played when these guys were even born, as it's all of those iconic late 60s, early and mid-70s Knicks for the most part. The guys that yep. we grew up watching and... Yep. Well, that don't, hung the banners here that read champions. Well, don't think it and think of all the great Big East finals in here, you know. Peters yep. with another corner three. And the teams are trading triples, and it's back to a double digit lead for Valpa. You watch Zach Peters in warmups, and he does not miss many shots. Good double team right there. In and out for Nate Austin. Really quick double team that forces the ball out of the post man's hands and you have to move it quickly to the weak side. Little one three one zone now shown by BYU. Weak spot the corner. Scara can't convert. Oh, good look. But the block at the rim by Hammock as he rejects Nick Emery. Nick Emery thought he got that ball on the board first. Foul called on Celius. That will put Carter at the line, and that's the second on Zach Celius. Well, Celius did a reasonably good job of picking up the dribble. Watch this now. Oh, that ball hit the board. Yep, that's goaltending. If that ball hits the board first, you got to leave it alone. And once that entire ball is above the rim, which with these backboards is pretty much uh, a formality, that one got by this... Uh, Outstanding crew. That's the final one and one for either team, and Carter can't hit. So it's the double bonus the rest of the way. As both teams have nine team fouls here in the first half. Back door, broken up. Caroms right back to Austin, so a reset to Collinsworth. Watch Collinsworth work, work in the low post. Fades away. Yep. He not only can score near Bob, but he is a great passer out of low post. And Emery almost cheated up there and got a steal. Shield Fernandez, way short. And a foul called. And that is going to go against Nate Austin. Watch Collins work now. He's going to work the low post all night as a guard. This time he's going to turn away from the defense and make the shot. But that's, you talk about home office. This is his home office here for a guard who can rebound, pass, and score there. Makes him really, really effective. And that speaks for itself. Look at that career. Triple doubles. He's got nearly 40 double doubles in his career. Six of his 12 triple doubles have come this season. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good when you double up Shaquille O'Neal in anything. That's true. Collinsworth is number 11 all time at BYU in scoring, but he's number one all time in assists and number one all time in rebounds. That's a rare double double. Absolutely. To lead a, a program in assists and rebounds. Most players that lead programs in assists are somewhere in the neighborhood of six foot one to six foot three, and most. Yeah. Players that average leading a program in rebounding history about four or five inches taller than Kyle Collinsworth. He's right in the middle and he's dominated BYU basketball history in both. Yeah, he really has. And of course, the WCC player of the year in a year where Gonzaga produced Wiltshire and Sabonis. Oh, they got a little ISO here. Carter sets up Walker. Austin the rebound. Hands it to Collinsworth from his rear end, able to shovel one off to Nick Emery and keep the possession alive. And now it's Collinsworth crossing over with the left hand, and it won't go to Von Walker as the rebound. Here comes Keith Carter. Carter for three. Sticks another. The largest lead for Valpo. It's up to 14. You know, when you watch Kyle Collinsworth, I don't think he's at his peak efficiency in terms of coming off that that uh, flu, but that's what he does right there. See, when he gets that deep in the lane, his his territory is the restricted arc area. That's where he can make plays for, the, for others. But if you look at his face, I still think he's suffering the after effects 
of that 72-hour flu virus. Steal by Chase Fisher. Goes right at Scarra and finishes. Fisher's been quiet as well. He can really light you up from outside. And you just saw the drive right there. He really improved his ability to get to the rim in the second half of the WCC season. Deep post position for Alec Peters, but it's knocked away. Peters gets a return. And that will be a kick on Austin, so it will stay with Valbo when we come back. Yeah, Kyle Collinsworth having a super season. You operate in here, this is his office. And right now... Garden, NYU and Colgate. Well, when the Red Raiders rolled in from upstate New York down to the Garden, it was usually a pretty big deal back in those days. Lob! Oh, they missed it. But Anacoya allows the flyby and is able to clean up. Well, there was a time back then where the two biggest sports in New York City were baseball and college basketball. Oh, yeah. and boxing yep. was probably right behind. I mean, the NBA was a non-factor compared to college basketball. No, there was no NBA back in 44. You know, it started, I think, 46, 47 season. By the way, Collins were getting it done inside again. Remember, this guy is not a great shooter by any stretch. Traveling calls on the drive by Jordan Chapman. 11 first-half turnovers. And these are the results back 1944 and 45 against LIU Brooklyn. As Valpo got the splits, they're a 500 team. Well, what happened? In, I want to know who won the Horn Levine fight. <laughs> you know, come on. <laughs> oh man, that Fran was, was home doing his homework. That was a sophomore year of high school. Oh, that was that was uh, a little before my time. <laughs> yeah, you say so. I never did get to the old garden as a matter of fact. Hammock for three. Off the mark, oh, crashing the offensive glass was Tavon Walker to keep it alive. Tremendous play by Walker. Hammock shuffled his feet. That's 11 Valpo turnovers. And the women's final four is set, and it's a surprising one. Oregon State will take on UConn. Washington will face Syracuse. So both the men and the women from Syracuse making it to the final four. Coverage begins Sunday at 5.30 Eastern on ESPN. And for more, you can visit NCAA.com, the home for all 90 NCAA championships. Somebody asked me on Twitter about four months ago to give them a dark horse team in the women's final four. I said Oregon State, and they got them. Because you are Fran for Schiller. No, it's because I'm a junkie. <laughs> and I guessed right. Chase Fisher doubled in the corner. Sets up Hartsock for three. That's too strong. Two minutes to go in the first half, and a BYU team that averages 84 points per game has been held to 26 by Valpo. Well, it's been outstanding defense, and Alec Peters, Valpo's star, has been relatively quiet. Here they get it to him in the post. He plays playmaker. Scarra knocks down a three. Chalk up the assist for Alec Peters. Absolutely. He's drawn a lot, he's drawn a lot of attention. Nice back cut. Foul called on Fernandez. So that will put Nick Emery at the line. And John Gaffney said Fernandez, who is a terrific shot blocker, didn't stay vertical, and he picks up a second foul. Great story, this young man out of Jamaica. One of 17 children, not only has his undergraduate degree, but he's finished one master's degree at Valpo, and he's likely to finish, finish a second before he ends a... Great five-year run in Valparaiso. Senior night last year, he got engaged at center court. Now, he already has a child and another on the way. He's got a bachelor's in international business, a master's in international commerce and policy, pursuing his second master's in international economics and finance. I'm just sitting here talking about basketball. He's a busy man. Peters, nice crossover and the finger roll for Alec Peters. One of the things that uh, Alec Peters told me today is he's really improved his ability to put it on the floor. He's not just a shooter. Collinsworth off balance, tangled up with Scarra, no foul called. The lob, Hammock, broke it up. 
And in the corner, it's taken, but stepping on the end line was Nick Emery. So we'll stay with Valpo with about a minute to go in the first half. Boy, how impressive is Valpo play when you think about BYU finishing their season strong, three wins. Valpo's a team that beat Florida State in their second round NIT game, a Florida State team that uh, has at least one, if not more, NBA prospects. But uh, really handled them well at home at the arc. Chapman replaces Fisher. They have forced 12 turnovers, Valpo. Foul called on Chapman as he hit Nickerson hard. So E. Victor Nickerson will shoot two. All right, you're Dave Rose. I'm going to put you in the locker room at mm -hmm. halftime. Yep. 27 points of the first half, and your team average is 84, and you are not a team that normally is going to hold the other group down. You are more of a let's go outscore them in a high-scoring game. Exactly. All right, halftime adjustments. What do you do to get your best players on track offensively? Well, you got to start with the defensive end because if you don't get some stops and defensive rebounds and you can't run if you're constantly taking the ball out of, the, out of bounds. So... I think you got to get back and talk about the fact that you've given up 50%, that uh, Valpo's shooting over 50 behind the arc, and uh, it's got to start at a defensive end so they can get out and run. Bob, we've seen them run effectively on misses, but it's been the fact that their defense hasn't been particularly effective. Emery with a hand at his face, knocks down the three right over the top of Scarra. Yeah, this is a guy that dropped 37 on San Francisco early in the year, a record for a freshman. Oh! How about that? by Shane Hammock, the answer as Falpo pushes the lead back to 14 with the shot clock turned off. Well, he wasn't getting much playing time at LSU, but uh, he's fit perfectly in the Skype to Bryce Drew system. Hammock played for the Netherlands on their under 16, under 18, and under 20 national teams. Eight seconds to go in the half. Collinsworth goes to work, pulls up. That's a little too strong. Peters just about turned it over. A flip at the buzzer. And that may have been good from Nate Austin had it gone down. It does not. It's a 14-point lead at halftime for Valpo. An explosive oh. plays like this from Shane Hammond. Absolutely. What do we expect from BYU? Well, Dave Rose pointing out the statistics that he took note of, that being 18 missed shots from the field, six missed free throws, and those 12 turnovers. And he said they're trying to at times make two plays at once. They've just got to take this possession by possession. He said all of the mistakes we made are things that we can control. we just got to get back to being ourselves. And as for Kyle Collinsworth, his conditioning and the shape he's in after battling the flu, he said, well, I gave him a good rest there. I'll try to give him a good rest in the second half, but we might need him on 20 minutes if we stay down in this game. A good start for Valpo as they begin the second half with a bucket from Peters to go up 16, but a quick answer from Nick Emery. Now Emery is a guy that we've seen heat up, so he's got to... And yep. Celius makes the hustle play. Here's Emery. Rims off a second chance. That's out of bounds. It'll stay with BYU. And Nick Emery can really light it up quickly. And I got to tell you, Fisher quiet in that first half. He can score points, as can Celius. I think, Bob, you've got to start on the defensive end of your BYU. Get some stops, and that'll get your offense going, especially in transition. The drive, the finger roll from Emery, a little too strong, and Vashil Fernandez is able to corral the rebound. Carter with a nice shot nice. fake and a ball fake and the finish. Well, that's not the kind of defense Dave Rose wants to see. He had an open lane he went right down Broadway on that drive. That shot blocked says Nick Emery is rejected. But then Valpo gives it away at midcourt. Fisher across the lane draws a hand check. Well, watch this drive by Keith Carter. He goes right down Broadway to Times Square, lays it in. You know, it's a walking street now up there by 42nd Street. Not a lot of traffic. 
Kind of looked like the lane right there. <laughs> An air ball on the fadeaway from Chase Fisher. We get basketball analysis. We get X's and O's, breakdowns, and tourist tips from Fran for sure. A little bit of everything. Now that time, that was more like 6th Avenue, a lot of traffic. And you see those numbers. They were, uh, I saw the Creighton game and absolutely outstanding offense. And tonight, their Seder defense has been out. It has been excellent. Scara wide open. Can't make BYU pay for the defensive breakdown. Well, in the first half, BYU had three assists. They averaged close to 17 assists per game. And the man about to go to the free throw line averages seven and a half assists per game. He's number five in America in helpers. But three assists and 12 turnovers in the first half, that is as bad as it gets, especially for this BYU team. No, there's no question. And I think if they're going to get back into this game, we've talked about the defense, but Collinsworth has got to do what he's just done, and that is get to the basket off the dribble, make some plays, whether it's on his own or kicking it out for threes. Kyle Collinsworth averages 15 a game, nearly eight and a half rebounds, and seven and a half assists. Those are like Scottie Pippen numbers mm -hmm. in 40 minutes in college. Does he have a chance at the next level in that tweener position? He seems like a very difficult player to pay. Yeah, the big thing is his outside shooting, and, and that's the one Achilles heel to his game. As I mentioned, he'll be in somebody's summer league, on the summer league team this summer. Fernandez has it snatched away by Collinsworth. Not sure Kyle will get drafted, but certainly he'll get his opportunity. Looks back to Celius, who frees himself for three. Collinsworth with the offensive rebound. And the stick back is good. And now some intensity on the face of Kyle Collinsworth. And that's what he does. He makes plays around the basket at six foot six. Talk about experience. He was on the 2011 Sweet 16 team, BYU. That was led by Jimmer Ferdet. Started as a freshman. Elbow jumper wide open and perfect for Keith Carter. Fisher down the lane. Around Fernandez who gets the rebound. Uh -oh. Carter off to Hammock. The long rebound. Tap to the corner. Peters runs it down. Tried to bounce it off Celius, but instead right to Collinsworth. That three won't go for Celius. Out of bounds, it stays with BYU. Well, I love what Chris, uh, Kyle Collinsworth is doing right now, having an effect on the game on a lot of different ways. The defense, his ability to get to the rim, make plays for himself, for others. Good kick out. And watch him work in the low post right now. Sets up Emery for the floater. Good. Yep. And that came because the defense collapsed on Collinsworth a little bit. The bad news for BYU, they have been held well below what their normal season average was, averages would be by outstanding Valpo defense. The good news is they can light a match and ignite into an offensive explosion at any time. And if you were going to want to coach a team that is down by 11. You want to mm -hmm. coach BYU when you're sixth in America in scoring because they can flip a switch. Yes, they can. They run it. They can shoot threes. Here's Fisher. Gets a return. Thought about an NBA three and instead drives it. A dipsy do. Earl the Pearl esque layup attempt that rolls off the rim out of bounds and it'll go to Valpo. Well, well what they're doing right now is they're chasing Fisher off the three point line. We've talked about his improvement as far as getting to the basket, but he's doing it against a guy that's the best shot blocker in the country back there in Fernandez. Little 1-3-1 now by BYU. You see Collinsworth at the top. This defense actually helped change the Creighton game around. Out of bounds on the sideline. Valpo turnover, so it will be BYU ball. When we come back, two teams trying to fight to Thursday night in the NIT championship game. Game two, the teams on hand as Jordan make their respective Final Fours. And speaking of women's basketball, UConn trying to continue their legacy. They have won 72 in a row, looking for their fourth consecutive title. Bob Shoes and Fran Fraschilla, Kelly Hartung here at the Garden. And Fran, it almost has now sparked that debate 
among basketball fans. Is it possible that UConn's success is bad for women's basketball? What do you think? I, I don't think it's bad because I think it's going to raise the level of, of competition from other schools. We see different teams in the Final Four this year. You can never question the amount of excellence that UConn has had. Gino R.E.M. is a Hall of Fame coach. They've got great players year after year. I just have to tell you, there's nights they're on and they're up 40. I'm just not going to watch. I'm just not going to watch. And it's not their fault. It's funny, though. The opposite at times is true in sports as the shot clock winds down to five. A floater for Walker won't go. Golf ratings were never higher than when Tiger Woods was blowing out the field in golf majors. That's Kafusi with the follow. Makes it a single-digit game and draws BYU even closer. Down to seven. You know, it seems like baseball ratings are never higher than yeah. when the Yankees are in the World Series. I get it, it does draw attention to a sport when everyone views a team as an evil empire and can someone finally go beat them? Yeah, and that's the problem. And nobody can beat them. You know, very rarely a Notre Dame or a Baylor can you know, rise up and beat them. And I say more power to UConn. Keep crushing people. I'm just not going to watch 40-point blowout. Speaking of rising up and coming back, here's Kyle Collinsworth. Off to Fisher. He's got a three. Timeout called from the bench by Bryce Drew as BYU cuts the lead to four. Chase Fisher, his easiest look of the night. You said it, Bob. They can score in bunches. Emory has 16. Collins. Uh, Collinsworth has 13 to go along with four assists. It was a 16 point lead at one point for Valpo. And BYU, the number six scoring team in America, has cut the lead down to four. Too easy, though, after the timeout for Scarra. That's what you call great execution versus the 1 3 1. It had bothered them out top. They got the ball inside deep. Little screening action. Got him an easy basket. See, I'd play through Collinsworth right there. Watch him now. Everybody's got to be alert. Jumper won't go. Uncontested rebound for Alec Peters. You see, Collinsworth is in that 1 3 1 at the top. Straight away, Scar. It's an air ball. He thought it may have been deflected, but. The officials say no, it belongs to BYU. Well, the women's Final Four is set. Oregon State, Fran's pick takes on UConn. And Washington, <laughs> a seven seed against Syracuse. I'm not saying in that game. Yeah, no, exactly. to get to the Final Four. Yes, yes, thank you. Coverage begins Sunday at 5.30 Eastern on ESPN. You can visit NCAA.com for more. The home for all 90 NCAA championships. Scramble on the floor in the NIT semifinal. Two teams trying to get to a championship game at 7 on Thursday on ESPN and the held ball will give it back to BYU and that's because Chris Collinsworth has been a major pest in this second half it started on the defensive end he's the top of that 1-3-1 zone and he has really caused havoc out there we've been talking about the turnovers caused by Valpo and how they hurt BYU in the first half Valpo now has 19 turnovers that matches a season high and we still have close to 13 minutes to play but the Crusaders get another takeaway. And that time Collinsworth got caught in the air and had nowhere to go with it. Tried to thread the needle, turned it over. You see where he is at the top of this zone. That's six foot six right there. It makes it hard to throw over side to side. Peters sets up Nickerson, who can't hit the three, but the weak side rebound ends up with Scarra. And a fresh 30 for Valpo. Yeah, Scarra's a really good dirty work guy. Should skip it right here. Nickerson bullets one underneath to Scarra. Yeah, nice job of getting into the crease of that 1-3-1 one, one by Nickerson. Scarra just snuck in along the backside. Allensworth dribbled one off his foot. And it belongs to Valpo. How often have you seen Bryce Drew go with this big lineup 
He doesn't have Keith Carter, Tavon Walker, or Darian Walker on the floor. He's got Shane Hammock out there at six foot seven, and Alec Peters at six foot nine, and they're handling most of the ball handling responsibility. Well, and Scarra can as well, Bob. You're talking six seven, six seven, six nine. They can play through Scarra in the high post. And Peters is a weapon out there along the three-point line. This is about as big as Valpo can go. Mm -hmm. Hammock for three. In and out. Foul called. And it looks like that's going to be called against Kafusi. So BYU back to their first half ways with three turnovers in their last three possessions. They had the lead cut to four, but Valpo you see in this photo have ever been to New York City. It's their longest road trip of the year. So you got Jacob Hartsock and Braden Shaw and Corbin Kafusi got their caricatures made. The uh, consensus was not exactly an accurate depiction of any of them, but isn't that the fun of it? <laughs> a little exaggeration. Hope they stayed away from the three-card Monty out there, you know? Stay away from those guys. You can go back to Provo with <laughs> empty pockets. BYU is the only team of the four here at the Garden this week that have won an NIT title. Valpo, this is their third appearance in the NIT, and they had never won an NIT game before this year. So this is their first trip as an NIT team to the Garden. I got to explain three three card Monty to people. I think right those those. Guys on the street, but you got to pick the card and yeah. they move them around. And if you have to explain the three card Monty to <laughs> someone, play it. it's, it's too late. Play. <laughs> the ship has already sailed. <laughs> yeah, BYU won this tournament 50 years ago. I think they've won it twice. Back in the early 50s. Bob. And it's broken up, read beautifully by Kyle Davis. Yep, saw it coming. Every team in America has that play in. Emery on the drive. Looks like he will draw the foul, so Nick Emery will head to the free throw line. And BYU, 12th appearance in the NIT, winning titles in 1951 and 1966. And I want you to think about this, Bob. In 1966, only 16 teams went to the NCAA tournament, so the NIT was a, a monster tournament. BYU that year... Uh, they they didn't go to the tournament. They beat Utah twice, but they lost to some other teams in the old WAC. So Utah was the representative, and BYU came to the NIT in New York and, and won it. By the way, they beat Bob Knight's Army team along the way, I believe, in the semifinals. Peters to the corner to Nickerson with 10 to shoot. Nickerson dumps one down to Scarra, shovels it to Fernandez. He's blocked by Kafusi. Davis left alone to drive the lane, but it's swatted up against the glass <laughs> by the leading shot blocker in America, Vashil Fernandez. Well, you saw why right there. Great timing. At three for the corners, an air ball from E. Victor Nickerson. Emery crosses over. English off the window. The tip follow won't go for Kafusi. Gets the loose ball. Here's Fisher. Emery. Short. Kafusi. Offensive rebound. Around Fernandez. Plus the foul. Oh, good effort right there. First of all, it started with great drive and kick basketball. BYU did a great job of probing that defense. And then Kafusi with the hustle. Now keep in mind, I mentioned earlier, Bob, this young man recruited for football at BYU. Of course, his older brother's gonna get drafted in a few weeks, Bronson. He grew during the mission. When he came back, he was about six foot nine, six foot ten, switched sports, and is still a work in progress, a developing young big man. And Kelly Hartzong, it's been more of a football family, the Kafusis, than basketball, but Corbin looks pretty good on the hardwood. Yeah, Corbin's dad, Steve, the defensive line coach for the BYU football team. Maybe teaching his son how to hold his ground firm there and his serve as well. Hammock back to the corner. At three off the mark. Darian Walker misses. Emery the other way. Shovels one off. Fisher leans in. Back outside. Celius a little too strong. Offensive rebound. 
traveling call on Kyle Davis. And they have done a really good job of attacking, as you see, Kyle Collinsworth right there getting a much needed, needed rest. And his teammates have very much picked him up, much like they did in that Creighton game at home last week. What once was a 16-point lead for Valpo. It's now one possession game. Watch Peters. He's working on the baseline. And the smaller lineup now back on the floor for Valpo to handle the basketball. As Carter and Darian Walker both coming back up. Shot clock down to three. Peters from the corner. Blocked. Great effort by the freshman Nick Emery to get out and reject Alec Peters. That's the guy I said little man before. Remember? The six foot two Emery? He doesn't play little. No, he, well, he definitely doesn't. He is a confident player. Floating to the corner. Fisher for the tie. Oh. And that's blocked out of bounds by Hammock. <laughs> wow, this was a great play by BYU. Watch Fisher. He's open. But watch, oh, there's, this is Emery. What a block. Terrific effort. Shot clock to 10 for the Cougars. Into the post, it goes to Kalfusi. Goes at Fernandez. Tied up. Held ball. Possession arrow belongs to Valpo. Yeah, Kalfusi didn't make his move in time. The double came quickly, and he tried to get through it. Couldn't do it. Good effort by Peters to lock him up quick double team watch that ball come in look how quickly Peters gets there and then he's uh, comes up with that ball and just rips it out of Kafusi's hands you notice Bob when you put Collinsworth and Celius up top how difficult it is to go side to side that ball was deflected it's not a turnover but it disrupts Valpo's offense now so the 1-3-1 has been really good and Dave Rose continuing to buy some time with Kyle Collinsworth on the bench. Normally we want to take your best player off the floor in a three-point game. But he might still be feeling the effects of the flu that limited his minutes in the win over Creighton. Hammock, extra pass to the corner. And it works beautifully. Alec Peters hits the triple. This guy's so efficient, Peters. It's been a quiet night for him. Only a junior. He's going to have some season next year. That time it's goaltending. As Michelle Fernandez tried to knock down the shot of Chase Fisher, but got it on the way down. And watch the ball movement now by Valpo side to side. Remember, we said earlier, Peters is hanging out in that corner versus the zone. That time, Hamick found him. Are you a fan of the 1-3-1, or do you think it has too many soft spots on the floor where you get open looks. I think the reason it's a good defense is teams don't see it very often during the year and you don't get to practice against it. So I think it can be a very effective defense in spots. Peters again. Emery with the outlet. Chase Fisher. Stepping on the sideline was Zach Selyus. Another BYU turnover. Valpo led by 16. BYU cut it all the way down to three, but they have been able to hold the lead over Dave Rose's team, who when they went to Times Square and spent some quality time. Yes, the head coach at Utah, Larry Kriskoviak, who uh, <laughs> earlier in the year canceled the, uh, the series with BYU, of course, it's a long-standing rivalry. I can't tell who's in the right or wrong, but it's obviously a shame they're not going to play, at least for the foreseeable future. They're not in the same league anymore like they were at the Old Mountain West. That three won't go for Keith Carter. So Dave Rose was laughing, saying, either we can't get away from Larry Kristoviak <laughs> or he can't get away from us, even if we're not going to play each other anymore. Here's Fisher leaning in, bounces it off the window and through. And this is as close as BYU has been as they cut it down to two. Fisher shot that ball right over Fernandez, who tried to time it. Now staying in that 1-3-1. The flatter 1-3-1 now.
Carter, same spot, tries again. This one's good. And Keith Carter's solid. Runs the team well. Makes enough threes at about 38, 39% to keep him honest. Emery able to drive. Floats one up on the rim. That's no good. The putback is for Kyle Davis. As he trips over Michelle Fernandez. Heading back the other way in the lead. One possession again. You know, for all the talk about the fast breaking that BYU does, they've been pretty good in the half court, especially the second half. Hammock for three. Yes. The same spot Carter just hit from against the 1 3 1. And that, to your point, Bob, they're starting to get a little more rhythm against that defense. Collinsworth back on the floor now. No look pass underneath for Wade Davis, rather Kyle Davis, pardon me, and a foul called. And it's going to go against Shane Hammock. And once again, Collinsworth getting the ball down low. That's Shane Hammock's fourth foul and the fifth team foul on Valpo here in the second half. BYU has only committed two fouls in the second half. Fisher down the lane. Scoops it around Fernandez. Sweet. And underneath the shot blocker. Fernandez went up. He went underneath his armpit. And BYU calls time with 5.43 to go. Well, check that. In the last five and a half minutes. They can stay aggressive, but if they're behind going into the last two minutes or so, they've only got two or three team fouls, then you got to start thinking about giving a couple so that you can get the defense to the bonus and put Valpo on the line if need be. In the meantime, they can stay very aggressive. Line drive three won't go for Alec Peters. A chance to make it a one possession game again. What you don't want to do for BYU is foul late in the shot clock. This time on the drive. Oh, man. Right at Fernandez oh. was Celius. And he met the nation's number one shot blocker. Oh, the last Jamaican that blocked shots in here like that was Patrick Ewing. Oh. A miss from the corner from Hammett. <laughs> man, did he get up. Collinsworth goes at Fernandez and scores. But I like that. That's what you do with shot blockers. You go right back at him. Try to get right through their chest so they can't jump. And now Bryce Drew does <laughs> want a Valpo timeout. So they're oh. one. Well, watch this timing here by Fernandez. Hits that ball at the top. Swagger, how about this? He met his wife while playing a pickup basketball game on campus. He told me she passed me the ball, I dunked it, and I knew it was meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> It's an interesting way to begin a relationship. Put your wife on a poster. That's one way to get posterized. That's right. <laughs> Under five minutes to go. Here's Peters. Down the lane. That's blocked. Oh, man. Kyle Davis turns into Vashiel Fernandez. That floater won't go for Scarra. Fast break opportunity for BYU. Collinsworth leans in. Plus the foul. With a chance to give the Cougars the lead. Man, the lights have turned green down Broadway. Watch the strength right here. Oh, who is liking that, Bob? Jimmer Fredette right there in the first row. Now playing his basketball for the Westchester Knicks. He's had a couple of opportunities on 10-day contracts to come <laughs> here to the Garden and play for the Knicks. And now he sees his old squad with a 7-0 run take their first lead, 64-63. Now how does Valpo respond? Hammock. Pretty loose. That oh. is a response. Ouch. <laughs> Fisher racing the other way. Can't score. The tip follow won't go. And they say Kyle Davis went over the back. Well, Davis is claiming that uh, Adekoya kind of got him underneath. But watch Hemmick right down the lane. Oh, man. Allensworth never saw him coming. <laughs> I'm not sure he could have done much anyway. Oh, man. And we're doing it at Madison Square Garden. You know? Four minutes to go. 
for the right to advance to a Thursday night championship game against either San Diego State or GW. That's our next semifinal coming up here at the Garden. Keith Carter fouled. And that's okay if it's on the floor because that's only the third team foul. And that foul was on the floor, and that takes us to the under four minute timeout. A one. Canarius Basketball Academy. And a pretty good night's work. He's all over the box score. Also, one other column we're not showing you there where he has four is fouls. So Hammock is on the verge of possibly fouling out. He needs to be careful as we come up on three and a half minutes to go. Foul called on Kyle Collinsworth, the hand check on Alec Peters. That's only the first on Collinsworth as again we check in with Kaylee. Guys, we started this game talking about the leadership of the upperclassmen for all four teams playing at Madison Square Garden. Well, in that last Valpo huddle, you could hear Alec Peters saying, guys, we've got to dig deep, and Vashiel Hernandez, Fernandez saying, go big now or we're going home. Well, they finally surrendered the lead for the first time, but a hammock dunk gave it right back to Valpo, and now they've got the lead with three and a half minutes to go. Valpo now spreading it out a little bit. They've got some guys on the floor that can beat you off the dribble. Peters, short. Really good help by Kyle Davis came over and gave uh, Collinsworth some assistance on that post up. Somehow I think Collinsworth's going to end up having an effect on this game, especially with the ball in his hands. The reverse rolls off for Fisher. He got to the baseline but couldn't get it to go. BYU back in that zone now. 1-3-1. One, one. You can see Collinsworth out here at the top. He's just going to try to stay in that passing lane, keep it from going side to side. Carter finds Scar. Well, they've done a good job of dicing it inside, Bob. Scar is in double figures for the seventh time this season. Worth. Yep, converts for Shield Fernandez on the bench right now. So the rim protector is not there for Valpo. And Collinsworth took advantage on the drive. He's got 20. And down the stretch, the ball's got to be in his hands. Two minutes to go. Peters with the miss. Nick Emery, the freshman, with the rebound. Emery for three. The long rebound, run back out by Kyle Davis. I'd play through Collinsworth again. Yep, that's what you want. Yep, throw it into him, see he'll post it here and make plays. Shot clock winding down, gives it up to Davis with the left hand, rolls it home. Yep. That's what you have to do, Bob. You have to play through Kyle Collinsworth in the low post. The lead to BYU coming up on one minute to go. Hammock down the lane. Blocking foul is called. And Shane Hammock will go to the free throw line with a chance to give Valpo the lead again. Watch Dave Rose go right back to Collinsworth. First to drive right to the rim. Watch him hang right there. And then in the low post, He's got the vision to find Davis behind the defense. He gets the basket. Shane Hammock has now been in double figures. Seven of the last nine games for Valpo. He had 18 against Florida State. And a second round win in the NIT. 80% free throw shooter. And one more free throw. See if BYU goes two for one. San Diego State and George Washington coming up next. The winners meet Thursday here on ESPN at seven in the championship game. Hammock for the lead. Comes up short. Tie game. One minute to go. Now tie score a little different because you don't want to shoot it. Let's see if they still may go for it. But it's got to go before 40. Collinsworth from the elbow comes up way short. 
Okay, now that was the mediocre shot. Now they need a stop, and they'll get the ball back anyway a second time. And Valpo will call their final timeout here to set up what might be their last chance with the basketball. Who knows with 25 on the shot clock and that 15-second differential. An average shot. They're worried about their what their athletic director and their boosters are thinking. Like, <laughs> how come that kid just took a bad shot? Even though Dave Rose playing the percentage, percentages gets two possessions to Valpo's one. Let's see what Bryce Drew came up with with the final Valpo timeout. It's got Keith Carter picking up his dribble. He'll take over again with 10 to shoot. Carter with the crossover to Hammock in the corner. Hammock sets up Scarra. And he's got a three! Does BYU use their timeout? Don't need a three if they can get a quick two. Do you foul if you're Valpo and not allow them to get a two off? Fernandez protects the rim, but the putback is good. 7.4 to go. BYU goes in and gets the two. And then Dave Rose immediately spent their final timeout. So Valpo's got the ball with a one-point lead. How about Fisher getting ready for this game? You notice that Alec Peters, their best player, is the trigger man on their press offense. This is a pretty good foul shooting team that's on the floor. And there it is. They'll throw the home yep. run to Hammock. Oh. Hammock fumbles it. And now the foul is committed. Oh, he had a layup or a dunk if he catches it cleanly. Uh, they did that a number of times this postseason in the NIT. Throw that ball long. Peters is the trigger man for this reason. And Hammock can nearly put this game away. Now the foul. So he's got to make two. Hammock came into tonight as an 80% free throw shooter, but he's two for four tonight. It's a one and one. That was team foul number seven on BYU. 4.7 seconds to go. Remember, Bob, you got about five dribbles to get it up the floor. And the 80% free throw shooter gets the roll of an 80% free throw shooter. Now, if he makes the second, both teams now out of timeouts, unable to talk it over. Does Valpo give the foul? If they've been as well coached as I think they are, they don't need a timeout. Okay, you got five dribbles. Here's Chase Fisher. Good if it goes, it's blocked by Hammett. Valpo survives, and they are headed to the championship game of the NIT on Thursday night.